On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including SpaceX testing an orbital Starship candidate, NanoRacks demos zero-G salvage tech, Dragon's heat shield testing finds a flaw, and the U.S. military unveils a plan to test nuclear tech for cislunar operations. There's a lot to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. Starship 24, SpaceX's most likely candidate for its upcoming orbital flight test, was finally rolled out of the production high bay on May 26th and wheeled over to Starbase's testing facility. Not wasting any time, the SpaceX crew hooked up the quick disconnects for cryoproofing and went right to testing, which is when something went wrong. A couple of loud pops and bangs signaled some structural movement, while video shows several heat shield tiles popping off and tumbling to the ground. No word yet on what exactly happened, but Tex later pulled a bent pipe from the vehicle. This could be what caused the damage, but either way, after some quick fixes, it was back to testing for S24. This was all done in preparation for S24's first static fire test, including a structural test done on the suborbital launch test stand to see if it can take the simulated beating that would be caused by those new Raptor V2 engines. And, as usual, SpaceX isn't taking any chances. Starship 25 was spotted in various states of assembly, adding to redundancy, and if the FAA approval comes in on time, the ability to launch more than one test in quick succession. S25's heat-shielded nose cone and various sub-assemblies, like the forward dome and sleeves, were seen being worked on, so it's not likely to be a long wait before we see S24's twin up and ready to go. The new models of Starship S24 and S25 are also equipped with a dispenser for the new Starlink V2 satellites, which can only be deployed in any meaningful quantity by Starship due to their increased weight. This would certainly be a big reason for the fast push for an orbital flight test, as an upgraded Starlink network is a big part of CEO Elon Musk's vision for the company going forward. Meanwhile, Booster 7 and 8 are reportedly busy getting fitted with their array of 33 new Raptor V2 engines ahead of their own static fire tests. B7 has already been through its cryogenic proof testing, more than once actually. If some of you remember, some nasty internal damage suffered by the booster was repaired last month, and the booster was retested. B7 is being worked on in the Mega Bay, while B8 is being fitted for engines in the High Bay. And although it seems that folks in the know are thinking Booster 8 will be the eventual launch candidate, SpaceX is clearly using B7 as much as possible before then. All of this being done with a backdrop of construction as the Boca Chica and Cape Canaveral Pad 39A facilities are continuing to be assembled. It's expected that the FAA could give launch approval as soon as May 31st, and SpaceX is wasting no time in getting as prepared as possible for launch. In 2018, Elon Musk launched a car into space. Some would say it's space junk, while others may call it performance art. And today, an emerging new platform, Masterworks, democratizes the art market by allowing anyone to buy and sell fractional shares in high-value works of art from artists such as Picasso, Banksy, Monet, and Warhol. Elon Musk is an outlier in this field, but most billionaires allocate 10 to 30% of their portfolio to art and the total wealth held in art equals 1.6%. $7 trillion, while Deloitte projects additional $900 billion worth of growth by 2026. The art market is the least correlated to stocks and bonds and is a good hedge against inflation, which unfortunately we're experiencing today. I never dreamed to have the ability to own works from artists such as Banksy or Monet when I started investing in art in 2019, so I love what Masterworks is doing to open up art to everyone. I prefer to buy and hold for longer periods of time, but Masterworks also has a secondary market where members can buy and sell shares if they don't want to wait until the art is sold. And for 
for those willing to wait, Masterworks has sold three paintings since 2017, each returning over 30% net IRR to investors. There's currently a wait list to sign up, but with my code, you can skip the wait list and start investing today. And now let's get back to the video. NanoRacks, a company designing orbital platforms like Starlab, have just launched a small test satellite aboard the SpaceX Transporter 5 rideshare mission. The goal is to test the feasibility of metal cutting in space. The small device was planned as part of NanoRacks Outpost Mars program and Demo-1 rode aboard the upper stage of the Falcon 9 with several other companies' small satellites. During the flight, instead of separating for its own mission, Demo-1 remained bolted in place and conducted a cutting test on three coupons of structural metal brought into orbit with the self-contained experiment. The test began about 9 minutes after launch and concluded about 10 minutes after that. The cutting tool itself is on a small Maxar designed robotic arm with a friction milling end effector, a friction cutting attachment that fits on the end of the robotic arm. The cutting tool runs at high RPM and melts the metal to create a cut, all while taking visual and thermal evidence with onboard cameras. It then continues to send back telemetry until the Falcon 9's upper stage deorbited and they both burned up over the Pacific. The experiment is fundamental for proving the concept of the Outpost Mars program, starting with the reuse of orbiting space debris. The metal chosen for the test is the same type of steel used in ULA's Vulcan Centaur rockets, and the test was meant to show that cuts could be made without creating more debris. NanoRack's stated goal is to reuse orbital debris to make everything from habitats to construction facilities stating both the need to address the orbital garbage issue and the need to save Delta V by building ships in space as opposed to launching them fully completed from the ground. Currently, their focus is on proving they can use spent upper stages in orbit to create more space station modules. Though we have yet to hear back from NanoRacks or their partners Maxar about how the test went, it's good to see more companies turning their hands to dealing with the space garbage problem in orbit. Any bit of recycling we can get should really help launches become safer in the future. SpaceX's next Crew Dragon capsule heading to the ISS will reportedly be getting a new heat shield after the current assembly failed inspection earlier last week. The upcoming Crew-5 mission, like every SpaceX mission, was put through rigorous testing to ensure the safety of reusing materials. This most recent test showed that there was some damage as a result of testing, and so Capsule Endurance will be using a different heat shield. SpaceX's thermal protection system is a layered approach to heat defense, making use of a backshell and ablative primary heat shield. An ablative shield is designed to burn away into gas, taking the heat of re-entry so the vehicle doesn't. This is in contrast to the heat shields used by the old space shuttles, which were meant to absorb and radiate away heat instead. Using the ablator method normally means some repairs are needed for the ablator to be useful again if they can reuse it. It's this primary heat shield that showed some issues. Obviously, a material designed to break apart for the benefit of the capsule and its crew would see some structural flaws from time to time, so SpaceX tests any material plan for reuse. Sometimes, however, the damage can be worse than normal. The Demo-2 mission came back with some unexpected erosion to the heat shield, so SpaceX made adjustments, reinforcing the affected areas, and carried on. During the Axiom-1 mission, it was reported that some hypergolic propellant from the Draco engines had found their way into the shield, causing a dangerous amount of wear. But NASA flatly rejected those reports in a May 24th statement. Regardless of any reporting mix-ups, NASA stated that every mission requires a full engineering review of heat shields and thermal protection systems before launch, which is why they are confident Crew-4, which launched just two days after Axiom-1's return, is safe from the current issues with Crew-5's shield. 
Crew 4's reused composite structure survived the testing that Crew 5's did not. NASA said specifically, SpaceX has a rigorous testing process to put every component and system through its paces to ensure safety and reliability. The test did its job and found a manufacturing defect. The NASA statement concludes with an assurance of crew safety being a top priority for both NASA and SpaceX, and the launch of Crew-5 is still expected for September 2022. The United States Defense Innovation Unit has stepped into the growing crowd of companies and agencies testing new technologies for upcoming expansion of operations into cislunar space. The U.S. military-run organization has revealed plans to contract two companies, UltraSafe Nuclear and Avalanche Energy, to develop nuclear-powered prototypes for propulsion and power generation. The goal is to have something ready for an orbital flight demonstration in 2027, about two years after DARPA plans to test their Draco nuclear engine systems. Avalanche Energy's Orbitron is a direct competitor to DARPA's Draco, while the Draco uses a nuclear thermal propulsion, NTP, Orbitron will reportedly be attempting a fusion engine. Draco's NTP is a direct improvement to chemical rockets, using fission reactors on board to heat propellants and fire them out of nozzles. This is expected to be two to five times more efficient than current chemical rockets. Orbitron's fusion systems will make use of a magnetron to trap electrons closer to their nuclei and produce highly charged energetic particles, which can then be used to power high-efficiency engines and power the craft's other systems. The benefit here, Orbitron says, is that this system can be scaled as needed. Ultra-safe nuclear, however, is attempting to redesign an old NASA standby, the radioisotope battery. NASA has used radioisotope power systems, or RPS, in some form or another to power deep space probes like Cassini and rovers like Curiosity since the 1960s. Most units are powered by plutonium-238 fuel, which gives off both power and the heat needed to keep systems running. A good example of an RPS is the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG. This is a generator with no moving parts that generates heat and power using the natural decay of its radioactive fuel. Remember that scene in The Martian where Matt Damon digs up the RTG? That's the one. While UltraSafe Nuclear isn't going into detail currently, they boast that their Ember Core radioisotope battery is chargeable and can provide 10 times the power of its more conventional plutonium-powered predecessors. The contracts don't specify what the prototypes will be used for, but it's clear that the DIU is attempting to keep its eye on all the developments in our cislunar sector as more and more companies begin to plan multi-year missions there. Nuclear-powered vehicles aren't much use in Earth's atmosphere, which is dense and close to easily irradiated humans, but their efficiency in space will be key to getting us from here to the moon or Mars and back again, both quickly and cheaply. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.